Our series has been concentrating on the idea of Jesus revealing to his disciples on the road to Emmaus uh, an explanation of how the Old Testament uh, not only spoke of the death and resurrection of Christ, but spoke of its importance, how it's central and how it's critical. And so in the process of that, what I've tried to do over the last few, well, really 19 weeks, is walk through some of those Old Testament expressions. And over the last several weeks, we've done it within the framework of the death and resurrection of Jesus, explaining a cosmic story that's told in the Bible. What's more, the death and resurrection of Jesus doesn't only explain the story, it it fulfills the story because the story is set up needing something as the finisher, the fulfillment. Now, I don't know how many of y'all work the New York Times crossword puzzles. I love to work them. Um, uh, it's a chore, it's not easy, especially by the time you get to Thursday. Monday's pretty easy. Tuesday's a little bit more difficult, but Wednesday starts getting a lot harder, and they, they culminate, and they make them harder each day of the week, and by the time you get to Thursday, I really struggle. But in this Thursday's New York Times, there was a 34 across, a narrative through multiple TV episodes. And I guess that's an appropriate clue. Everybody seems to be binge watching TV right now. And you can find a TV show that may have small little plot lines for each episode, but often they'll have a storyline that that goes throughout the entire season or through multiple episodes. A narrative through multiple TV episodes Eight letters, it is the story arc. It's that arcing story that goes across all of the different episodes. Well, the Bible is a collection of 66 books. They're books of different kinds. You've got books that are historical, that are giving history. You've got books that are prophetic, that are giving insight of of, of the word of the Lord in particular times and eras. You've got a love story. You've got uh, uh, stories of of, um, lamentations and sadness. Uh, You've got law. You've got Um, uh, poetry. You've got all sorts of different books. But all of those books have a story arc. All 66 books combined have this one story arc that, that I'm calling the cosmic story. It is the full story of the Bible. And it go, it's, look, if you want to look at it, you can look at it in a lot of different ways. In a sense, this cosmic story is a mystery story. My mom loves a good mystery book. She has been reading them since she ran a bookstore, the Walden's Bookstore in Memphis back in the mid-60s. And she loves a good mystery book. My, my daughter, several of them at least, love mystery shows on TV. Uh, Monk is a perennial favorite. We watch the episodes over and over and over again. We love it. Well, the Bible has a cosmic mystery story as a story arc. Rabbi Paul says it this way, that God saw fit in Christ to bring to light What is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things? This story arc is a mystery, and in Jesus, the mystery is revealed. This story arc is a story of evil and deception. Paul in Ephesians 6 says, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. 
We wrestle against rulers and authorities and cosmic powers over this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. You can look around you. There is evil in this world. You can look at history. There is evil in this world. How else can you explain the Holocaust? How else can you explain genocidal purges of the 20th century? There is an evil that exists. But it's it, it, evil and deception, you know, in, in Revelation, John the Revelator has a vision, and in the vision, the great dragon's thrown down that ancient serpent who's called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. I have some friends who tell me, I can buy into the whole faith thing. I think there's probably a God, but, you know, the idea of there being Satan, that's, I, I, don't, I don't believe that, that there's this evil being out there trying to trick and deceive the world. And my reply is generally always the same. It's, ah, so he's already tricked you out of that, huh? Because that's the, his ultimate deception. The ultimate deception of the enemy is to get you not to believe he exists. I mean, if you believe he exists, you're looking for him. If you don't figure he's there, he can walk in the front door. He can shoot someone dead on the street and you won't suspect him. The biblical story arc is a story of evil and deception, but it's one that finds its victory in Jesus. The story arc is a story of despair. The writer of Ecclesiastes says, I turned about, I gave my heart up to despair over all the toil of my labors under the sun. And you find this arcing story of despair because God made humanity to be in fellowship with him. And through sin and deception and evil, humanity fell from God and is separated and isolated from that intimacy of the fellowship. And that leads to another way of the story. It's a story of death. Humanity died in a very real sense when it embraced rebellion to God. Oh, I mean, Adam and Eve were still walking, but they were dead men walking. The death sentence had already been pronounced. And but for God's ability to set it aside out of his living outside of time, they would have been gone at the moment. But Paul carries this same theme across in Ephesians when he says, even we, when we were dead in our trespasses, God made us alive together with Christ. It's this overarching story arc. It's this narrative. It's this saga. It's this cosmic story. It's a story of death, but it's also a story of life. Jesus said in John, I give them eternal life. And they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hands. Jesus reverses that story arc. And how he did it, how God did it, is a story of suspense and advent coming. Because in the Old Testament, God promises he's going to fix things. He tells Abraham, I'm going to do it through a male offspring of you. And he continues to trace that through Isaac and through Jacob. He continues to trace it through David, and it's going to be someone of the offspring of David who's going to sit on the throne forever. But how God's going to do this? Oh, there are shadow visions of what God will do. But there's a certain level of suspense that's building up in history and in the storyline. 
And that suspense starts to be revealed in Bethlehem. As the angels say, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people, not just the Jews. This is the promise to Abraham was, through your offspring shall all the nations be blessed. This is the good news of great joy for all people. Because ultimately, this overarching narrative is a love story. This is a story of God so loving the world that he gave his son. This is a story of Jesus who has a greater love. For greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. So we get to read this story, and you read it from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22 in this overarching narrative. And some of the fun for me in reading this story is this is a story that's steeped in foreign language and culture. And we've had the blessing of smart women and men who've translated the Bible into English and smart scholars who've translated the culture of the Bible into modern culture. But we need to understand that. We need to see the story steeped in foreign language and culture so that we can understand the story today. And this is very important to all of us because this overarching narrative, this cosmic story, this is our story. This is personal to me, and this is personal to each of us. And so, when we read our Bibles, we see this story is told over and over. It may take different shapes, it may be in different forms, it may be in different colors, but it is the constant throughout Scripture. And that constant finds its fulfillment, its meaning, its... its, its uh, totality in the work of Jesus. And so we've talked about that in here. We talked about the tabernacle. We used a model, but we talked about how the tabernacle itself is a prophetic story of Jesus in many ways, in the ways the priests served within the tabernacle, in the way the tabernacle was designed, constructed, built, transported, set up loads of ways that the story narrative is told through the tabernacle. The story narrative is told through the temple which followed the tabernacle. Now the tabernacle was set out before Moses. Uh, not, not before like time-wise. Set out in front of Moses. God revealed to Moses the story of uh, the explanation of the tabernacle how it should be built, why it should be built that way, etc. And so God told Moses, build it exactly this way. And the temple then proceeded from the tabernacle once it became time within Solomon's reign to build a permanent tabernacle for the Lord, not a portable one. So the tabernacle and the temple and all of the priests that served and all of the sacrifices that took place can be called the Mosaic system because it was a system under Moses. And we talked over the last couple of weeks about how Jesus fulfilled the Mosaic system. Jesus is not only reflected in the whole concept of the tabernacle as Jesus became flesh and tabernacled among us, John 1:14. But Jesus is, even in the details, the sacrificial lambs, the, the, the altar uh, of Isaiah 6, um, even Matthew explains that Jesus is the curtain, and Hebrews explains, he is the curtain that divided the holy of holies from the holy places. And so within the framework of Scripture, we've got Jesus fulfilling the Mosaic system. But last week, 
I talked about Melchizedek within uh, the confines of the teaching of the book of Hebrews and the Old Testament book of Genesis and a reference in Psalm 110. But Melchizedek is used in Hebrews to say Jesus not only fulfilled the Mosaic system, he fulfilled something that's even greater than the Mosaic system. He fulfills something that preceded the Mosaic system. In the system of Moses, the Levites are the priests. They take sacrifices. They receive a tithe, a tenth of the the, the resources of the people. But all of those priests were embedded within Abraham as their progenitor, their forefather, their DNA source. All of them were embedded within Abraham when Abraham bowed down in worshipful subservience, if you will, to Melchizedek, who is like unto Christ. He's a high priest of God. He's a priest of uh, the king of Salem, peace. King of righteousness. All titles that are given to Jesus in some variation and form. Because Jesus became a high priest in that sense, not in a limited sense of the Mosaic fulfillment only, but in a much greater sense as well. So Jesus fulfills the Mosaic system. He's the high priest that goes into the temple, that, that, that offers himself. But, but more than just the high priest of the Mosaic system, Jesus is a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, someone who's not Jewish, not a descendant of Abraham, but is greater than Abraham, not based on lineage. We don't know Melchizedek's father, mother. We don't know when he was born. We don't know when he died. None of that's given. But Abraham bows down to him, pays homage to him, gives a tithe to him, breaks bread and wine with him. And so within the cosmic story, the point of that we dealt with last week was Jesus fulfills not only the Mosaic system, but he fulfills the true destiny of humanity. The true destiny of humanity is fulfilled in Jesus. Jesus, who is the way for all of us, in our destiny of this cosmic story. See, Jesus is God made man, a true human being. And as a true human being, Jesus brings humanity to the throne of God. King Uzziah made the mistake of thinking, he was a good king, by the way, Old Testament king. And they didn't have a lot of good Old Testament kings. Uzziah was a good king. But in his later years, he got what we would say is a little uppity. And in his later years, he decides that even though he's not a priest or a high priest, he decides he's allowed to go into the Holy of Holies, where he's not allowed to go. Only the high priest. That's the throne room of God. That's where the Ark of the Covenant is. That's where the mercy seat is, which has the cherubim, which serve as either the throne, the seat of God, or the footstool of God, depending upon which prophet you're reading. Both images to be grabbed. And good King Uzziah goes in there, and he's not qualified, he's not competent, he's not suitable, he doesn't belong. And he goes in deceived into thinking it's okay. And as a result, he's cursed with leprosy. He dies. And in the year that King Uzziah dies, the prophet Isaiah finds himself caught up in a vision that seems vividly real. 
And in that vision, Isaiah is in the actual throne room of God, of which the temple holy of holies was just a shadow. And Isaiah knows what happened to King Uzziah. Isaiah's not a priest. He doesn't belong. He's not suitable. He's not clean enough to be in the presence of God Almighty in his throne room. And, God, and Isaiah says, woe is me. Oi. Woe is me. Oi in the Hebrew. Woe is me. Because I'm a man of unclean lips. Lips being an expression of everything he says, everything he does. And I dwell in the midst of unclean people and my eyes have beheld God. Man, if Uzziah for going into the shadow got blasted, can you imagine how blasted I'm going to get? And the reason Isaiah doesn't get blasted is because God has an angel fly over to the true altar of heaven and take from the sacrifice on heaven's altar an ember and touch Isaiah's lips, representing who he is, what he says, how he lives, and purifies him. That whole prophetic story is a recognition that Jesus, a true human, will come into the presence of God and bring humanity to the throne of God because when the sacrifice of heaven's altar, Jesus, touches us, we have every right in the world to be in the presence of God. God calls us into his presence. He provides the sacrifice of Jesus because he wants us in his presence. So Jesus fulfills the true destiny of humanity through his suffering and his death as he conquers sin's final consequence, death. And he gives life to the dead. So this story is told over and over in different shapes and forms and colors. And today we're going to look at it. And next week we're going to look at it through Ezekiel 37. This is the story of the Valley of Dry Bones. Now, I want to tell you that story, but before I do, let's see if I can just give you kind of an idea of what's going on here. So, understand the writer of Hebrews. Let's come over here. The writer of Hebrews says, you want to see Jesus fulfill destiny. This is Jesus fulfilling the true destiny of humanity. The destiny of humanity is fulfilled by Jesus when you look back. And he looks back to the temple and the tabernacle. And he looks back to Melchizedek. And he shows Jesus fulfilling the destiny of humanity. Now, here's the fun part. Ezekiel shows the same thing. But Ezekiel is back here, and he shows it by looking forward. And he shows Jesus fulfills the destiny of humanity looking forward to the time of Jesus and to the end of days. And so you've got kind of a bookend situation where you've got Hebrews looking back and Ezekiel's looking forward, but they both got the same message. So if we go back to the PowerPoint, Ezekiel in the Valley of Dry Bones, Ezekiel in the Valley of Dry Bones, is a great story. Um, in synagogues, they have uh, half Torahs that are read. They're called half Torahs. The half Torah is, so every week in the synagogue and on holy days, 
in synagogue services, you read a portion of the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And, and so you've got your Torah reading, but you don't only read from the Torah, you also read from the Nevi'im, the prophets. The reading from the prophets that accompany the Torah readings are called Haftorahs. And so this story in Ezekiel 37, the Valley of Dry Bones we're gonna talk about, is read on the Sabbath of Passover week. It's an important story for understanding within the context of God redeeming his people, which is the story of Passover. God pulling them out of slavery and out of the death of Egypt into the promised land and life and freedom. So this is a story that accompanies that reading in temple services. Now, if we were high church, if we were Anglicans, where we read from a lectionary and we had readings scheduled at various times, the Valley of Dry Bones gets read during the Easter period. Some years it's read during Lent also. Some years it's read uh, during Pentecost. But it's always read during Easter. Easter, of course, being a celebration of Passover. A celebration of not only Jesus being resurrected from the dead, but a celebration that's rooted firmly in the promise of Passover. Another story, which is that same storyline. God, through the death of a lamb, will pass over the death that's going to occur for everybody else and his people who live under the blood of the lamb in the houses that have been painted with the blood of the lamb, an unblemished lamb, a male lamb, those people will be redeemed from death and brought out into a promised life and land. So let's look at the story for a moment. The story as the English Standard Version does it is in three uh, paragraphs. I've got something new I'm trying here. Becky and I were talking about this last week. She's inspired me to try this. Let's see if this works. Ezekiel 37, the Valley of Dry Bones. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. And by the way, Ezekiel, whose name means God is strength, Ezekiel is not supposed to be around bones of people. Ezekiel's a priest. Bones are unclean. Should have made him shudder. But I guess if God's your tour guide, you don't really get upset at where he's taking you. There's no indication that he shudders here. He's just following God's leading. He doesn't correct God for taking him. God, you realize I'm a priest. This could affect me. Um, and God led Ezekiel around among the bones. And behold, by the way, I love that hine in the Hebrew is behold. Uh, if you were, if you don't have people around you and you're watching on the internet, just say, hine, hine, hine. It's a, it's like, whoa. It's a, 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 a mark of astonishment. Uh, typically it gets translated just as behold. Sometimes it's not translated at all, but when you're reading it in the Hebrew, it's like, whoa. And he leads, God leads Ezekiel among them, and whoa, there's like lots of them on the surface of the valley. And whoa, they're very dry. These aren't recent. Now you're thinking, that seems a bit strange. I don't remember ever being in a valley and seeing a bunch of human bones just lying around, wet or dry. 
This, remember, this story is different culture, different language. So if we go back to the PowerPoint for a moment, I can tell you that this was actually not a joyful sight, but it's one that wasn't uncommon or unheard of. Sennacherib had been the king of Assyria century plus before. And Sennacherib had come down from Assyria, conquered just a ton of folks, conquered uh, a lot of Israel, uh, Judah. Um, and Sennacherib, in, in, in you read his obelisks where he talks about his victories, and he says, with the bodies of their warriors, I filled the plain like grass. Goes on to say he did some pretty nasty things to the bodies as well. But this is the way a conquering king would come. There would be this huge battle in the plain. And they didn't go back and just say, hey, let's get all of the enemies and let's take their bodies and give them good burials. They just left them. And the birds and the wild animals would come and feast on the flesh. And after they'd done that, some of the bones and all that's left months years later are dry bones just there in the valley waiting for dirt to cover them up it wasn't just Sennacherib but Irshad and another Assyrian king is talking about the people who aren't loyal to him and he said may Minerta leader of the gods fell you with his fierce arrow and fill the plain with your corpses give your flesh to eagles and vultures to feed on I'll tell you this I drive down the road and 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 the other day I saw some animal I don't know skunk squirrel something on the road that had been hit by a car and I saw it because of the buzzards that were there picking on it that flew off when I drove by only to fly back down and continue to have their dinner. Well, they don't treat human bodies any differently. The animals come and eat. So if we go back to the, the scripture, the bones are very dry. And God said to me, son of man, can these bones, bones live now think about it here very dry do you remember princess bride which is one of the five best movies of all times it ranks up there with the godfather one and two with the good the bad and the ugly with fiddler on the roof it's a really really good movie worth seeing and in it wesley is supposedly dead and they take him to miracle working max to bring him back to life a miracle working max says he's not really dead he's almost dead there's just enough left to where he's able to use the billows from the fireplace and bring him back to life this is not that this is not a situation where someone's died and they get the paddles out and they yell, clear, and bring them back to life. This isn't one of those experiences where they code blue at the hospital and jab them with a needle of, of, uh, of uh, whatever that thing is that makes your heart beat real fast. Um, uh, words slips my mind right now you get it when you get real scared or excited it's a hormone and it pfft. no this is down to dead dry bones so who's going to make these bones live and i answered and said oh lord god uh, you know and this is where i wish i had a video of the scripture because he could mean three different things by that like i don't have a clue you know or he could mean, you know. Or he could just mean, you know. I mean, it's you. We don't know. But he says, oh, Lord God, you know. And then God said, prophesy over these bones and say to them, oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Now, this is hilarious to me. They don't have ears. Ears. 
He, Ezekiel is told to prophesy to the bones, hear the word of the Lord. What are they supposed to do? Take uh, their bony fingers and cup it to the side of the skull and say, let me listen. They don't have any ears. This is especially funny because in, in Ezekiel, I want to take a moment for you and I want to, we're going to do this if we get it here, compare Ezekiel 12 2 on this passage. So here's what we've got. We're reading this right now, Ezekiel 37. Prophesy over these bones and say, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to the bones. Ezekiel's already told about the word of the Lord coming to him in Ezekiel 12, saying, Son of man, you dwell in the midst of a rebellious house who have eyes to see, but they don't see. They have ears to hear, but they don't hear because they're rebellious. So the people with ears aren't listening to God, but the dead bones with no ears are going to listen. I'm sure there's a lesson to that somewhere for us. But let's go back to it. So we're in Ezekiel 37 in the Valley of Dry Bones. Hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to the bones. Behold, I'll cause breath to enter you and you'll live. And I will lay sinews upon you and will cause flesh to come upon you and will cover you with skin and put breath in you and you will live and you will know I am the Lord. I love that. So that's the vision that Ezekiel has. And if we set his vision aside for a moment and go to the second paragraph, the second paragraph tells you what he did. We're still in Ezekiel 37. So, I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a sound and, and a rattling. And the bones came together. You know the song, Dim Bones? Toe bone connected to the foot bone, foot bone connected to the ankle bone, ankle bone connected to the shin bone. Oh, hear the word of the Lord. It comes from this story. Sarah, would you like to get up here and sing that forever? No, okay, not. Um, the bones came together, bone to bone. And I looked and behold, the sinews, the, the connective tissues were on them. And the flesh came upon them, the muscles. And then the skin covered them. But there was no breath in them. And he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God. Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on the slain that they may live. I'm going to talk about this more next week because this is running really close to the John 3 story of Nicodemus and its language. And we'll talk about breath and wind and spirit. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them. And they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. This echoes Genesis 2, 7 and, and lots of other things we'll talk about next week. But I want you to see the actions this week. And then let's go to the third paragraph where the meaning is set out. So Ezekiel 37, here's the meaning. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up. Oh, that, by the way, behold. It's, uh, I, I didn't keep emphasizing it, but Hine is in here over and over and over. And behold, there's a rattling and the bones come together, and uh, there's no breath in them, and behold, the sinews were on them. I mean, it's over and over and over. Behold, our bones are dried up. Our hope is lost. We're cut off. If you read that in Hebrew, it's so sad sounding. It's just, ooh. The ooh sound in Hebrew comes when you have this vav 
with the vowel next to it. That, that looks like a staff with a dot next to it. That's a ooh, ooh, ooh sound. So, uh, hine, behold, uh, behold, they say, Yevshu Atzmotenu Vaabda um, Tik Vatenu Nigzar Nu Lanu I mean, it sounds like a ghost. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up, our hope is lost, we are indeed cut off. And it's just sad, sad sounding in the Hebrew. And so Ezekiel is told, prophesy and say to him, thus says the Lord God, I'm going to open your graves. I'm going to raise you from your graves, O my people. I'm going to bring you into the land of Israel. We'll talk about this next week probably, but this is being prophesied in Babylon. And you'll know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O oh my people. And I'm going to put my spirit within you and you'll live and I'll place you in your own land and you'll know I'm the Lord and I've spoken and I'll do it, declares the Lord. By the way, well, Let's, let's, let's keep going. Let, let, let me not get distracted. I want to tell you this before I run out of time. This is a crisis narrative. This part of the story arc that's being told by Ezekiel is being told in a crisis. Realize this story is steeped in foreign language and culture. We'll get into it a lot more next week. But when he talks about being dried up like bones, that's beyond help. That's not just dead, but way dead. That's not Princess Bride Wesley dead. That's like dead, 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 dried bones disconnected dead. And the promise in Jesus is restoration. You know, Jesus comes, it's no um, accident that all three synoptic gospels tell the story of the man with the withered hand. Because that Greek word withered is the same word being used here for dried up. His hand was dried up bones, and it needed restoring. Even John, not a synoptic, talks about how Jesus came and helped the paralyzed and uses the same word. Jesus says to the man with the dried up bone hand, come here, and he restored his hand. I told you this biblical narrative is a story of despair. You see the despair here. Our hope was lost, is lost. And in Jesus, that hope is returned. In the death of Jesus, we see the end of this story arc. It's looking forward. Their hope is lost. They're dead bones. They've got no life. They've got no hope. They've got no future. They've got nothing. And God says, who's able to fix that? The Lord God is. And we know how now at the end because 1 Peter 1.3 tells us, according to God's great mercy, he's caused us to be born again to a living hope. A living hope. Not a we ha our hope is lost. We are dead bones. We have been born again. We've been born anew. And now our hope is alive. And it's through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. That's the fulfillment of the story. That's the fulfillment of human destiny. Their hope was lost, but our hope is returned. 
Paul writing to the Thessalonians, that these were Christians who heard Paul's story and believed Paul's story, but they thought Jesus was going to come back any day now. And so when people died, they thought, oh, but now they're gone. They didn't live long enough for Jesus to come back. How sad. And Paul had to write them and say, we don't want you to be uninformed about those who have gone asleep. He didn't even use the word dead, though that's what he's talking about. We don't want you to grieve the way other people do who have no hope the way they were grieving in Ezekiel's time. Dead bones. Don't grieve like that. Because we believe Jesus died and rose again. There is a resurrection. Even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who've fallen asleep. See, one of the things that we miss, because we read the Bible from the end, we, it's spoiler alert, we know what happens. And we don't understand that God did not reveal everything the way a dump truck dumps dirt at your doorstep when you need it in your garden. It wasn't like, bam, there's your dirt. God revealed it progressively over centuries and millennia. It's a story arc. It's not a data dump. And because it's a story arc, the Jews at the time of Ezekiel didn't even know that there really was a resurrection from the dead. You read the Old Testament up to that point, and there's not a real clear indication. Well, there's this shadowy Sheol that's talked about in some of the Psalms. and Maybe they predate this. Isaiah kind of has a little bit of a reference or so to this idea. But it really wasn't intact. I'll tell you, by the time of Jesus, the Sadducees still didn't believe in a resurrection. This is the main passage that is credited by scholars historically, including Jewish scholars, for turning the Jews around to begin to understand there is a resurrection from the dead. But before that, there's not hope of such. And Paul says, don't grieve like those who don't have any hope. Because that story of death in the Bible is also a story that finds its fulfillment in resurrection. Paul told the Romans, if we've been united with Christ in a death like Christ, we'll be united with him in a resurrection like his. So I'm excited to get into this story with you next week. I'm excited to look at it and to see how it's echoed in the New Testament and how it brings to light more New Testament passages. But you and I need to understand as we walk away from this that this is our story. And I'll give you one glimpse of how the New Testament explains this story to kind of get your whetted appetite for next week. Why does God do all of this? in the valley of dry bones. Why is God got on here? Thus says the Lord God, behold, I'll open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. I'll bring you into the land of Israel and you'll know I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves. What on earth is that about? Where is that coming from? I want you to check Ezekiel 37 verses 12 through 13 and compare it with what happened when Christ died. Prophesy and say to him, Behold, I'll open your graves and raise you from your graves and I'll bring you into the land of Israel and you'll know I'm the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves. Look at Matthew 27, 51 through 53 and behold... Hine, if it was in the Hebrew, it's edu in the Greek, same word, same expression. Behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. That's a reference to the body of Christ being torn as that which kept out people from the holy presence of God, the curtain. 
and it was torn by God. That's why you, you tear something from top to bottom, it's being torn up there. You can't be doing the tearing at the bottom and have it tear from the top. God tore that dividing curtain of the temple. It was torn from top to bottom, and the earth shook. By the way, remember Ezekiel, the valley of dry bones. God says, and the earth will shake. The earth shook, and the rocks were split, and the tombs also were opened. And many bodies of the saints who'd fallen asleep were raised in coming out of the tombs. After his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and bring you into the land of Israel. And you will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you out from your graves, O my people, O those set apart, my saints, my holy ones. We need to read this story and we need to understand that in the grand saga, what Jesus teaches us as the fulfillment of the story and destiny of humanity is that, if we go back to the PowerPoint, God is the Lord. And that's our story. We worship a God who gives hope to the, where there is no hope who gives comfort where there is no comfort, who gives love where there's bitterness and hatred, who conquers evil with love, who overcomes evil with good. We worship of a Lord who finds life in the midst of death. And that's what he brings to his people. And it's all out of love. And Jesus takes us and brings us into the very presence of God through the work that he did, through the, the, the rending of his flesh, through his death, he is that door through which we have access to God and we come into the presence of God, holy and undefiled because we've been washed by his blood. And that's our hope and confidence of eternal life. That's why when someone dies who's, 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 who's among us, we, we don't grieve the way others do. We, we live with a confident expectation of what God will do. If we can be of any service to you, through e um, if you want our email announcements, if you want to be listed and get a copy of the video thought for the day that I try and do each weekday, if we can pray for you, don't hesitate to email us. Want more at biblical-literacy.org. Got to have the dash in there. But I want to bless you as we conclude this study this week. And it's really, look, when I was a kid, Batman was on every week, and they would tell you at the end of, of the cliffhangers, uh, tune in next week, same bat time, same bat channel. So that's your tune in next week, same bat time, same bat channel. We're going to finish this and bring it, put a bow on it. Father, would you bless those who hear this message, quicken in their hearts a desire to hear. Lord, don't let us have ears and fail to hear. May we listen to your word and see the majestic sweep of your love story for us in all of its, its uh, permutations. Through Jesus, amen. See you next week.